Uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, week number five lecture, which is about destructive tests. So in the previous two lectures, first we talked about the different types of supplies, uh, impulse, AC and DC. And then we said that we need certain arrangement for the measurement of those voltages. Now, why we generate those voltages, why we measure them and the current to do testing. So today we'll talk about uh, power system uh, dielectric testing. So the lecture will be specifically more uh, talk about the dielectric test because there are many other tests we do on the equipment. Like for example, the uh, resistance of the winding, like the no load loss, like the load loss. So there are many other things we do for transformers, circuit breakers, but our concern here as this is a high voltage course, we'll talk about the tests that are related to the insulation system. That is what concerns us. And the tests are some of them we do them in the lab, which will this is will be talking about this week and next week. And there are some tests and inspection we do them at the site. And that's what we'll be talking about after we came we finished the, the term paper uh, presentation. So that is the two main categories of tests. Today we'll talk about basically the destructive test, and we'll see what we mean by the destructive test. So the pertinent test, so this that are done at the premises of the manufacturer, okay, are classified to the following. The first type is called routine test. So every single component has to go through this test. So you manufacture 100 units, you have to test the 100 units, all these type of, uh, of tests. Then there is something called the type tests. Type test is basically done on each design, okay? so. For example, you are doing transformers. You have 50 kV transformer, 100 kV transformer, 500 kV transformer. So every single design has to go through these type tests. And these type tests are usually, uh, uh, you are doing them with a third party. Okay, so an independent lab. And we have here worldwide many high voltage labs, independent, like uh, for example, uh, one of the most famous one is Schema. In the Netherlands, we have Chessie in Italy. We have here in Canada Kinetrix. So those labs will test your equipment, uh, and then they give you a certificate, and that is the proof that your design uh, can withstand that. Now it happens that after some time you might change something in the design. Now once you change something in the design, you have to redo that these type uh, type tests. Then the final type of test called them special tests. These tests are not routine, they are not typed, but from time to time, customers will come and ask about those, uh, those tests. So it is, uh, per, I mean, this is based on the request from the customer. So it's not a routine or a test that you have to do it for every, for every single uh, design. I will give some examples as we progress in the, uh, in the notes. Uh, yes, please, Reza. Can ask, go ahead. Uh, there is another test, it's called sample test. Uh, do you categorize this to special test, sample, and design test? Uh, these are for the outdoor insulators. Oh, for outdoor insulator only. Uh, so, yeah, because there are too many of, uh, too, too many of them. But even in, in uh, outdoor installators, uh, there are some routine tests that's done on each test, okay? Now, sample test, that is, I, I think, because it's not just, this is, could be like a fourth category. Uh, you are absolutely right. But for example, in transformers, we don't do these ones. Uh, we don't do uh, random tests. These random tests, you do them, uh, for example, when we do the test in the transformer during the manufacturing process. So we take random samples and we do some measurement to ensure that everything is, is correct. Uh, so, uh, for example, dimension wise, so we take the random samples from the windings and do the measurements, uh, but routine test, no, for all, all of them. Random test is done is with certain products when you have too many of them and you cannot do the this test for all of them. So statistically, it is acceptable to do these tests on uh, random samples. Uh, and you can have like a sort of probability that, okay, when we, we do like 10 samples or 20 samples, that is, that's okay. But the, as I said, this is usually not on big products like transformers or cables or circuit breakers. 
but uh, in the manufacturing of the transformer process, we have the random test, but this is during end process manufacture. Thank you. Okay. Uh, also, the laboratory test can be this, uh, can be this, uh, classified into destructive tests or non-destructive tests. Now, destructive test, the outcome of it is pass-fail criteria. So either the transformer or the installation or the cable passed the test or it failed the test. So there is no quantitative measures of how good is the installation system other than pass and, and fail. Those destructive tests, there are two types of them. One of them called self-restoring and some of the other one they called non-self-restoring. Now, self-restoring is the installation system like air, that whenever there's a breakdown, if you wait a while, air will regain its installation capability. So you can repeat the test. The flashover, if it happens on air, you can repeat the test many, many times. However, non-restoring uh, installation systems, like for example, uh, XLPE in, in, in a cable, that is not, so once the cable failed, it failed, you have to throw it away. Non-destructive tests, which we'll talk about next to you, these are give you some quantitative measure to tell you how good or how bad is your installation. And of course, the most common test that we used for non-destructive is partial discharge. Partial discharge is considered by, I mean, testing different equipment, that this is considered as one of the good indications of how good is the, is the installation system. Now, all of these are under laboratory tests, but we have also field tests, like commissioning tests. When before you do the commissioning of the equipment, you have to do certain tests. Uh, also, for the inspection, the routine inspection of the assets, you need to do certain uh, certain tests as well, but those we'll talk about them later on, the field tests. So, this is the definition of self-restoring and uh, non-self-restoring systems. A self-restoring system, when a failure happens, you can repeat the, the test. Air is one example. Oil, to certain extent, is also another example, because once you circulate the oil, the carbon uh, that is released, if you are using mineral oil, will be like dispersed. And for a couple of tests, that's okay. But non-self-restoring, this is basically for the solid insulation uh, systems. Now, what we'll be doing today, I will take three examples, three assets, which are the transformers, outdoor installation systems, and cables. Of course, you can talk about many other uh, uh, assist, uh, assets also, but I selected those uh, for a couple of reasons. The first and the most important one is I am familiar, especially for transformers and outdoor installators. I have practical experience to share it with you. I have research experience also to share it with you. And also cables, I'm very familiar with, uh, with cables as well. But also whatever uh, I've mentioned to these assets, you can apply the same thing, the same principle uh, about other assets as, as well. Okay, so here's, let's look to the transformers here. And here is the dielectric tests. Now the dielectric tests, there are two main categories of dielectric tests, the transients, okay, and the low or the power frequency. The power frequency test, the applied voltage and the single phase induced voltage, these tests are basically routine tests. So these are part of the routine test of the transformers. The three phase partial discharge, this is, we'll talk about it next, next week. Lightning, uh, either full or chopped, these are basically type tests. Now, when you look here to the table, so this is our concentration about the tests for the for the insulation system. Now here we have no load loss, excitation, current. As I said, these are we have nothing to do in the insulation system. When you look to the uh, thermal test, we have the heat run test. The heat run test will measure the oil rise and the winding rise. Sometimes we can some uh, with some uh, configuration we can find the hot spot as well. Okay, so these are more thermal tests, but we have to do something with the with the insulation system. Here is others or the special tests. One of the tests that uh, we used to do is the noise, the sound level tests. So the sound comes out of the transformer. You might have, if you are uh, walk, 
beside a transformer, you might hear heard this humming sound. This humming sound is basically coming from the core of the transformer. Uh, because of the AC, the uh, sinusoidal, the dipoles changing directions every uh, for every cycle or every half cycle. So this humming sound is the vibration of those cores. So we try to do certain things basically to uh, uh, to try to uh, hold the core and avoid this type of vibrations like a glue. And also we, there are certain core material we use basically uh, to uh, reduce the, the sound level. The sound level is for certain countries as a concern, like in Europe, because you have limitation in the space and North America is not of a big uh, concern. Mega test, we'll talk about the mega test next week as a non-destructive uh, test, basically to, 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 to know more about the insulation. Uh, it could be destructive, it could be non-destructive, but it, it depends how, how you do it. We'll talk about that uh, later on. Now here, the short circuit test is one of the famous tests we do there for transformers. Uh, and basically here you apply the rated current and the rated uh, voltage is different than the load loss. So also called the short circuit test here. These tests are done basically to find the load losses of the transformer. Here you apply rated current, but very, very small voltage. There you apply both the rated current and the rated uh, voltage, and this will cause a huge current because of the short circuit that you have it on the secondary side. And this is, you see, to see the integrity of the mechanical uh, 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 part of the, of the winding. When, when, because when there is a huge current, there's a mechanical force happening in the winding and you wanna see how good is your insulation uh, system. Okay, now here that the transformer that, as we know it, it's basically uh, subjected to both normal and abnormal dielectrical stress. So for example, if you have a transformer that is 13.8 kilovolt or 500 kilovolt, you expect to see that the transformers as a normal type of the load that you can have up to 5% extra of those voltages. These are normal voltages, okay? Can go up to 110 volt at no load conditions. As you know that whenever there is no load, the voltage uh, increases between five to 10% increase. That is, uh, which is for the power frequency that is expected. Also, there are some other abnormal, uh, there are some abnormal uh, voltage stresses coming from different things. Uh, one of them is coming from switching events. Whenever you open a uh, circuit breaker or for when you, when you add connect a capacitor bank there will be a sort of a transient okay and also when they uh, for especially for pole mounted transformers there is as well some uh, lightning surges also this is caused an, an over stress on the transformer also sometimes when you have a ferro resonance which is basically a resonance between the capacitance of the cable and the ferrite material, which is the core of the transformer. You will, have, if you have a resonance, that will lead to also some over voltages. Now, these over voltages are different from each one uh, based on the frequency content. Some of them they are having very high frequency, very fast rise time, like lightning. Some of them they are moderate, like switching. Some of them are very slow, like ferro resonance. The transformer should be able to withstand both the normal operations, the little bit of increase during the normal operation, as well as those transients. How to ensure the integrity of the insulation system? How to ensure that your transformer, your cable, your insulation can withstand? Here comes the test. Now here talk about specifically about the, the transformer. So this is a routine test, and this is called the hypo test. Sometimes we call it the apply voltage test. Sometimes we call it the separate salts voltage test, test, SSV test. Okay, so how this is done. Now, this is the transformer on that test here. It's a three phase transformer. This is the high voltage and this is the low voltage side. We're concerned about the high voltage. So we short circuit the whole winding, three uh, terminals of the high voltage side. And also we short circuit the three terminals of the low voltage side. Now the, the 
the short circuited low voltage bushings or terminals will be connected to the ground. So the whole LD side will be grounded. From the transformer, the three short circuited connections will be connected to the bushing or to the high voltage side of the testing transformer. This is my testing transformer. Okay. We have a switch here. I have a voltmeter to measure the low voltage and then I know how much high voltage I'm applying. It's a single phase transformer. So we connect all the three phases together and apply the voltage. We apply the voltage for one minute and then we wait. If there is no increase in the current, then the transformer passed the test or if there is no collapse in the voltage, it means that the transformer actually passed the test. Now, what does this test is basically uh, testing in the transformer? In the transformer, there are two main insulation systems. It is the insulation system between high voltage and low voltage, between high voltage and ground, low voltage and ground. And that's what we call them the clearance in the, inside the transformer. So that test basically is, with this configuration, is testing the clearance of the high voltage to the low voltage, the high voltage to the ground. Because remember, the transformer will be inserted inside the tank. The tank is grounded, and the high voltage windings basically are the one is in the close proximity of the of this grounded uh, tank. So if there is not enough clearance, or if the insulation system is not good to insulate the high voltage from the grounded low voltage or grounded tank, you will have a flashover. So that is something. Uh, Every transformer has to go through, but this is to measure the clearance of the, of the transformer. Now, these are some standard voltage tests we apply. Here is the, the system voltage level. So, for example, uh, 12 kilovolt, 17 kilovolt, and so on and so forth. Usually, 12 kilovolt system, uh, if you live in countries like, in, uh, uh, for example, in the Middle East, some of the countries in the Middle, Middle East, 11 kilovolt is a standard. Uh, primary voltage level. 17 kilovolt, some other countries, is 13.8 kilovolt. So if, you, if your system is working under 11 kilovolt, then that is the voltage level you refer to. If it's 13.8, that is the voltage level. Uh, some, some of them may have 33 kilovolt, then that is the voltage level you refer to. Okay, so that is the highest system voltage levels. Now here is the power frequency test voltage level. So if you are at 12 kilovolt system, you apply 28 kilovolt for one minute, and the transformer has to withstand that. If it is 13.8 kV transformer, you have to apply 38 kilovolt, and you have to wait, and so on and so forth. Second test is what we call the induced over voltage test. In the induced over voltage test, we apply the testing through a three phase transformer. So that is the transformer that is basically under test. Now, this is the transformer under test. It's a three-phase transformer. Here, we do not uh, actually uh, try to short circuit anything. Now, here is the supply. This is the, test, the transformer that is supplying us with the voltages, okay? And we connect the high voltage of that transformer to the low voltage of the transformer under test, okay? So we, for example, if our transformer is 13, 0.8 kilovolt, uh, 230 uh, 30 volt in the secondary. So we connect the high voltage of the testing transformer to that 230 volt. Now, because the transformer now is basically working in normal operation, you will have an induced voltage at the 13.8 kilovolt. Okay. So you apply from the low voltage side, and then you apply. You find the induced or you produce the induced voltage in the, in the other side. So both the low voltage and the high voltage are stressed. Question is, why we don't apply to the 13.8 kilovolt? It is just a matter of uh, cost, because to have a generator that can produce up to 400, kilo, uh, 400 volt for the low voltage side is much, much cheaper than having a generator that can produce 13.8 kilovolt. It's easier to induce the voltage at the high voltage, uh, at the high voltage side. Now, for that uh, type of test, what we are basically testing, we are testing the turn to turn insulation. Now, between the high voltage turn to turn, 
between the low voltage turn to turn, there is an insulation system. And the voltage per turn, either in the low voltage or in the high voltage sign, is equal to 4.44 times the frequency times the flux density times the cross section area of the core. So that voltage per turn, I am actually testing now. Can my transformer handle this voltage per turn? Okay. Now, when we apply this test, we apply double the voltage, okay, but at a higher frequency. So, for example, if the transformer is 230, we apply here 460 volt. Okay? So we are in, we are inducing double the voltages at the at the 230 volt, and here also at this will be like 27.6 kilovolt. Now, why we increase? Uh, uh, why we increase the, the frequency is from this formula, because if I double this, okay, and if I everything will be the same, if I leave the same frequency as uh, 50 or 60 hertz, and the cross-section area, this is the cross-section area of the core of the transformer, of course, that is, doesn't change, this is fixed. So the only thing now will, will be is the, the flux density. That would be double as well. And what is wrong with that? Now, if we go back to the basic principles of the transformer design, I mentioned, I sent you one video before about that, which is the BH curve, okay? So this is the B, the flux density, and this is H. And the BH curve is basically something like this. Now, H is number of turns in the winding times the current divided by basically uh, the link, the magnetic link, and B is the flux divided by area. So you see here, usually we design the transformer at the knee point here. This is the flux density that we use, which is basically between 1.8 to 2 point something, maybe one or two Tesla. Now, if I double the frequency, sorry, I double the voltage without changing the frequency, I am doubling the flux density. So I'm going deep into saturation, which will cause overheating in the transformer. You will not have a proper induced voltage in the in the secondary as well. So this is why we have to increase the frequency. This is why this supply is a special supply. This is basically mainly done for testing the, the transformers. We don't have this high frequency supplies used for other than that. That is the main objective of it. So we apply, this is for how long? This is 120 times whatever rated frequency that your equipment divide by the test frequency but that should not be less than 15 seconds. We used to have the test for around 48 seconds when we used to test our transformer. So we select the parameters to match the 48 seconds. Now, so that is for the these two tests, both the uh, several source voltage or the high voltage test and the induced over voltage test. These are low frequencies. Okay? Now, there are other transients happens in the system that we also need to test the system with those transients okay now those transients we don't uh, they are not there all the time but it happens switching resonance, lightning these things happening and also sometimes we don't have to be uh, at the close proximity uh, of the event, meaning that the transformer doesn't have to be connected to a switch to see the transient of the switching, or a lightning hit the transformer directly, no need for that. Uh, why is that? Because if you have, let's say, an overhead lines here, okay, and the lightning hit somewhere, somewhere far away from the transformer, your transformer is here, very far away, there's something called traveling waves. So that transient that is hit here, it will part of it will travel this way, part of it will travel that way. Yes, there will be attenuation, but it might reach the transformer. So even if the transformer is far away from that, it still can reach the, the transformer. And here, this is when we design the transformer, we design it with what we call the basic insulation level. I'm thinking to add at the end. Uh, of the lectures. One lecture about this basic insulation levels, about the, how we design a transformer or the equipment, generally speaking, and how we protect it 
like for example, using arcing horns, uh, surge arresters, something like that. So I'm trying to fit a presentation about uh, these aspects of protection of the transformers against the uh, those uh, transients. And if a transient failure habit in the transformer, who is responsibility? Is, is it the responsibility of the utility or the responsibility of the manufacturer? Each one actually shares certain responsibility. So I, I'm hoping to uh, arrange one presentation about that. Okay. Now, transformers for power transformers, we do the, the lightning tests for all of them. So impulse tests are done for all power transformers. But for distribution, it is considered as a five test. Now, this lightning impulse test, what it does simulate, as I mentioned, the traveling waves due to uh, lightning or even due to the switching uh, events. Now, there are, if you remember, we talked about the standard uh, lightning voltage, which is 1.2 by 50 microsecond. This is the starting, this is the rise time. And this is the fall time. There are some other types of lightning as well called the shopped wave. We'll talk about that and we'll see what does it really uh, represent, why we do the shopped waves, not just the fall wave, and also the switching event as well. So this is basically the full wave or the full lightning impulse, and this is the shopped lightning impulse. We talked about him also when we talked about the generators. So this is the rise time here, and this is the fall time. The rise time up to 90% is the 1.2 microsecond. And here's the shop. We try that between three to six microsecond. We shop the wave. So it is like our regular wave. And then at certain point here, we shop, we shop the wave. We make it go to zero very, very suddenly. So there is very uh, steep uh, slope in the voltage here. And that is really uh, represents something. I will talk about it as we progress. Uh, let, let, let's look to, uh, this is uh, actually a schematic of the, uh, basically an impulse uh, testing for a transformer uh, by a manufacturer, one of the manufacturer, sorry, one of the testing labs. So this is my transformer. The transformer, basically you have UVW. These are the, uh, this is the European way of numbering. We call it UVW, one, U, one, 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 Two, 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 U, two, U, V, two, W. So that is one side of the transformer. This is the other side of the transformer. Now we are we are testing the primary side of the transformer here. Now this side is Y connection uh, because, as you can see here, there is a neutral, and this is the secondary side is basically a delta uh, connection. Now, this is your impulse generator here. This is the impulse generator basically. And we know that the impulse generator, we have sphere gaps, we have capacitors, we charge them in part. So this is the commutative capacitance. So we charge the capacitors in parallel, we discharge them in series. So this is the total capacitance when you add all the capacitors in series. And this is for the rise time and for the full time, the resistors to shape basically <coughs> your waveform. Now, here is comes the shop gap. This is the gap that we use if uh, if we want to shop the impulse, we connect this gap here so that now here you have the voltage coming at this point connected to the transformer. So basically you have an impulse coming like this. Now it comes here at certain, if we if we connect this, if we don't want to connect, to have a shopped wave, we remove that completely from the test. But if I want to see, if, if, if I wanted to produce a shopped wave, I connect these sphere gaps and I adjust the sphere gap and we understand now that sphere gaps is basically one way to measure the voltage. So I adjust it so that it will break, uh, the, the, the air here will break, and we have a short circuit here when the voltage basically reaches certain certain level. When it reaches certain level here, uh, during the fall time, it will shock the wave, and we will, uh, we will have a, a very steep, uh, decrease in the voltage in the impulse. Now, when I show you the waveform, how it looks like, I will tell you why we are doing this test. Come here. So basically, we we have three phases in the impulse. We test every single phase of the transformer, and I will tell you what is the sequence, how we do the, the testing. But we short circuit everything else. Now, while doing the test, we measure. We have to measure the voltage. So basically, here you can see there is a capacitive divider here. 
to measure the voltage that we apply to the transformer. And also there is a current that we try to measure. And we will see that this, this current is from the, the other side of the transformer, which is the secondary, and we connect it to this detection, detection circuit. Now, let's see how we do the lightning impulse test. This is the recommended sequence that we use the test. First, we start the test with a reduced voltage level. Now, what are the levels? As I mentioned, I will try to talk about these things in details in another presentation, but just to give you one example, if you have an 11 kilovolt system, we test it usually at 75 kilovolt. 75 uh, kilovolt, that is the uh, the peak value of the impulse. Okay, if it is 13.8 kilovolt, we test it at 95 kilovolt. If it is 33 kilovolt, we test it around 175 kilovolt, and so on and so forth. So there is a table, there's a standard for that we test. So now the first impulse we apply, we apply it at 50 to 70 percent, just a reduced voltage level. Why? to establish a reference pattern of the waveform of both the current and the voltage. We want to see at that reduced level, which we know for sure there is no failure happen here, what is the reference waveform? And every time when we do the test, we compare it to this. I will talk about what is the passing criteria of the impulse test as we when we show you the, the, the waveforms of the of the test. Okay, so basically then after that, you apply one full waveform at the 100% of the basic insulation level, which is, depends on the rating of the transformer. Then two shops. Now, these are optional. The shop waves, sometimes we have them, sometimes we don't have them. Now, the shop wave, we use them in basically pole mounted transformers. We don't use them in pad, usually we don't use them in pad mount transform most of the time. Why is that? Because pole mounted transformers, basically, if this is the bushing, we have to, now these are basically on pole mounted, so they are subjected to lightning events. So to protect them, one of the way to, to protect them is basically, this is an old technology, we use uh, arcing holes. So the, the lightning hits here, and if it reaches a certain level, there will be some conduction in these arcing horns, that is, they are connected across the, the bushing. So the lightning, instead of going through the pushing to the transformer, it will divert its way through the arc holes, through the arcing here, back here to the ground to protect the, the transformer. Now, this arcing horns, basically, it chop the lightning, okay? And the transformer will be subjected to the severe, uh, actually, uh, dV by uh, by dt. This is why we need to test the transformer. So most of the time we use the shop waves in uh, basically pole mounted or outdoor transformer that are in outdoor conditions uh, that they might be subjected to a lightning. Then another one full wave and then end up with that 75%. Uh, okay. Now, so how we can detect if there is a failure happened in the transformer. One of the clear idea or the clear uh, points that we use, we look to the impulse voltage. Okay, so this is my impulse voltage that we apply. If the impulse voltage, if the insulation can withstand, there is no collapse happened in the voltage waveform, so the insulation system can withstand these impulses all the time, then it means this is a, a good sign. Another sign, we compare the waveforms of the uh, reduced and the full, both the current and the voltage. And if there is no significant change, and the standard says apparent or visible change between the waveforms, then we consider the samples pass the test. But if, the t if there is some, something like clear uh, difference between the two, most likely, the insulation system did not pass the test and it actually failed failed the, uh, the test. So it is, there is a room of basically subjectivity in the test. In my personal opinion, that is left uh, for the manufacturer uh, to give them some sort of room to negotiate if the transformer failed or not failed. It's not 
a very, very clear criteria. But of course, there are certain cases you cannot deny. They are basically our uh, uh, field transformers. Now, what is the explanation? If there is a change in the waveforms. Now, the transformer is an insulation system. So it's basically capacitance. There are windings, so there is inductance. So whenever there is a failure happening, it means that you are shortening part of the insulation. It means that you are changing the inductance capacitance of the system. Then this is basically your uh, impulse. Now they will see it's like an impulse response of a system. You are seeing a different system now. So the waveform now, the waveform output, because of the change of the inductance capacitance in the system, it will be different. This is how you can tell if there is some, some problem. Now, this is two waveforms. This is the reduced waveform. Let's try to understand it. So this is again coming from a, a manufacturer. T1 is the lifetime 1.45 microsecond. As I said before, sometimes, uh, not sometimes, there is some tolerance around 30% for the lifetime. So why? Because it's, it's impossible to have it exactly every time at 1.2 microsecond. So we give some room. So that is the rise time, and this is the fall time. It's 47 microsecond, and the peak value is 492.2 uh, kilovolt. Okay. Now that is the voltage. This is the voltage that you measure. Okay, and this is the current. This is the current I mentioned. This is the response. So this is the output of coming from the secondary side of your of your transformer. This is phase A. You are testing phase A at tabbing 9B. So you are changing the tab changer position and you are basically uh, recording recording that. Now, this is the full waveform. Now, when you look to the waveform here, this is the rise time. This is the fall time. So it is 47.9. Again, there is some tolerance. And here is the voltage is 9042. This is the full voltage. It's around 950 kilovolt. Okay, so this is almost half that voltage, 50%. Okay, now let's look here to the voltage waveform. Look here to the voltage waveform and see even here the little bit of change here and look to the here. They are identical almost. Okay, look to the current. This is the current waveform at the reduce and this is the, the current at the full. Again, other than the magnitude, they look identical to each other. Okay, so that is a clear path of the transformer. Now, if, for example, at the follow, we start to see something like this, some ripples, a change, there's a change here in the current, then there is a partial failure happening in the transformer. If you see a collapse of the voltage here, something, I'm not talking here about uh, basically a shocked wave test, no, the regular test, you apply the full wave here, the lightning impulse waveform, and then you see a sort of, uh, damage, uh, uh, collapse in the voltage. So you know for sure that this is basically a sign of, of failure. This is the shocked wave again. Okay, so here it is, the, this is the rise time. This is the shock time, 3.56. I said it's around between three to six micro microsecond. And here is that the voltage is uh, 42. So this is uh, half the voltage, this is for, a 95 kV uh, impulse voltage level, okay? And here is the full waveform. Okay. So this is the vol this is the current, and this is the, the voltage. Again, when you notice the two, this is the reduced, this is the full, they are identical, and here is the current as well. So again, the current looks like uh, very good. Now here, uh, you notice that the polarity of the voltages are negative. And that's not coincidence. All tests, when you do the impulse test of the transformer or any equipment, we do it at basically uh, at negative uh, impulses. And there is a reason for that because if the transformer actually passed the negative, for sure it will pass the positive. So the negative is more severe than the positive. Now, why is that? Now, this is need to be explained in the dielectric course, more of the dielectric material, why this is happening. Okay, so that's not here the scope, but uh, what I want to mention here that having the uh, the test basically done at this voltage level, that's not a coincidence. That is actually uh, done uh, intentionally to have uh, the, the negative one. Then we have the switching impulse test. The switching impulse test here, we have the test for longer time. Okay, so the, here the rise, uh, the, the big value, 
uh, is uh, lo no less than 100 microseconds here. The fall time is no less than 1000 microseconds compared to 1.2 by 50 microseconds. You have had much longer rise time, much longer uh, fall time. Okay, so that is here that voltage is significant for long time, it's high for long time, that the core flux buildup can have it. Okay? So there would be like some sort of an induced voltage because there is some time for the build up of the core or the flux to have an induced voltage on the on the side. Now switching test, we don't do it for distribution transformer. We only do it for uh, basically power transformers. And the reason for that is that for distribution transformer, the switching event or the switching voltages are much, much less than the lightning voltages. So it's not severe, it's not very important. However, the switching events in power transformers and high voltage levels are more severe than the lightning. So we have to test the transformer against the switching, uh, switching events. Any questions so far? Okay, so the second we'll talk a little bit about it before we go for the break. We have a break after like uh, 15 minutes. Okay. Now, outdoor insulators uh, basically are used. Uh, this is one of the examples of the self uh, strained uh, system level. So here, for example, this is basically recently Abdullah uh, took it in the high voltage lab. This is here a uh, two disc insulators. This is while doing his research. Uh, basically, he's doing on trying to detect uh, damages of ceramic insulator using ultrasonic sensors uh, using machine learning as well. So here you have here a flash over habit on the insulator surface. Now, when you when flash over is over, you can retry the retake the test and it will withstand the test. I mean, not at the same voltage level, but it can at the normal operating voltage. It you can it can work again and have two, three, ten times the flash over. As far as you are not damaging the ceramic insulator itself, the breakdown is happening only in air, so there is no, no issue here at all. Now, outdoor installation systems are used in different applications. For example, here, this is what we call the cab and pin insulator. Here, these are ceramic insulators. Here, we have the insulators of uh, load brake switches. Okay. Here is that we have the insulators for the bushings of an S6 circuit breaker. So outdoor insulation system is used in many applications, and we have what we call the dry power frequency flashover for the uh, self-restoring insulation system. This dry power uh, frequency, power frequency, power frequency means we are talking about here 50, 60 hertz. So we we test the samples against that voltage. Uh, voltage uh, frequency. Now the the flash over the dry flash over the dry means that you don't have any wetting agent on the insulators is much higher than the actual voltage that would be applied to the insulator surface. Okay, so if you have let's say thirteen point eight kilovolt, the dry flash over will be like seventy eighty kilovolt, something very very high, much much higher than the regular voltage that you apply to your uh, insulators. Now, because the flashover basically is a test that is controlled or it is affected by the humidity, by the temperature, you need always to do a, some sort of correction factor. You have to uh, record the values that you have your, uh, basically uh, your test you have been done at that conditions. You have to record those values and then you have to correct it against some standard uh, values. Now, there is also wet power frequency flash over. So, this is a dry and this is wet. I sent you a video that compares between the wet and the dry, and I've shown that for the dry tests, it is the voltage is much larger than the wet surface. Now, why we do the wet surface? Because insulators are in outdoor conditions. So they are subjected to this. So they are subject to contaminations. And we'll talk about the drive and arc and how it happens uh, later on. Uh, but insulators are basically, because they are in outdoor conditions, we have to test them under wet power frequency as well. 
Okay. Now here, when we have rain, when we have dew, when we have mist, this will considerably reduce the flash over capability of the outdoor insulation systems. And these tests are basically done to evaluate the shade design. Now we look here, these are cap and pin insulators. This is the normal one. So this is the corrugation you see here at the bottom. These corrugations to increase the leakage distance between the high voltage here to the ground here. So this is to increase that distance. But you see that the profiles, they are different. We have different profiles. For example, this profile, there's no corrugation at all. This is an aerodynamic, use them in deserts, for example, so that you will not have no accumulation of dust on those insulators. There are sometimes called them fog types. We have like deep corrugations compared to this one. That is will increase significantly the leakage distance, and then that can help to improve the insulation uh, or the leakage uh, uh, flash over from those insulators. So we use for all these tests the IEEE uh, standard for 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 testing. Uh, here is, for example, some examples here for for these tests. For example, this is for the wet uh, test and how we control uh, different parameters. Uh, for example, the temperature uh, and resistivity of the water that we use. So the, temp the, the because the temperature can really impact the uh, conductivity uh, of the uh, or, or the resistivity of the water. So that has to be uh, controlled as well. Uh, this is the resistivity of the water that we use. And here is uh, basically the procedure that we use. There are some tests. We have a uh, standard test procedure. We have the insulin in vertical and in horizontal positions. Okay. And uh, also here, uh, the, we, we have co a conventional procedure. This is the European standard. And here it is the US pra uh, practice uh, and so on and so forth. Also, we test the insulators against the 1.250. When you say 1.2 over 50, then we mean here that uh, basically the lightning. So we test the insulators against the dry test, wet test, and the uh, lightning test as well. And again, the methods are mentioned in the ITB standard uh, four. I think if you have access to the ITB Explorer, I believe you have, you can have access to this standard, the ITB standard four. And also here we need to uh, apply the uh, atmospheric corrections. Now, there are certain terminologies we use here, for example, the critical flash over. Now, in lightning, it, is, it comes like a probability of failure. It's not deterministic at what uh, failure you have. So we have something called the critical flash over. This is CFO, or we have 50% chance that a flash over happens or a withstand happens. So this is called a critical flash over or 50% of probability. We have the statistical flash over or the SFO. Here it is 99.8% that you have a flash over or three standard deviations of the 50%. It is also the withstand or 0.13% probability that there will be a flash over or three standard deviations below, below the, uh, the 50%. Uh, so this is the main important terminology that we have to come with, critical flash over, statistical flash over, and the withstand. So here, this is the test. Yeah, this is again 0 0.1, 0 0.2250. So here, these type of insulators uh, between uh, 48, we tested at 48 to uh, 490 with the median values. And we do that 100 times. So we test it at 100 times. Okay? So this is, we call it the multi-level test method. Okay? This method gives you very accurate result, but it is really time consuming. As we will, as we'll see. So we do the test 100 times between 480 to 490, and we have 5% of failure. Flash over five out of the 100 case, they have a flash over. Okay. And then we do it from 500 to 510. This is the median value. We have 32 of flash. 
Then from 515 to 525, you have 83 percent, and finally we have 95 percent. Okay, so we take these results and draw them here. So these are the four numbers we have here. These are the same numbers here. These are the 5, 32, 83, and 95 percent. So at this one here, this uh, voltage here level here, it is around. It is the same as this voltage, which is 485. So this is around 4. Here is 480, uh, 485. And here it's a 5% chance of flash over. Here, this is the one here we have it at this voltage level, which is basically at 505. And we have here a 32 chance of flash over. Okay, and so on and so forth. And then we can draw here a line. Okay. Now I can find the prob the fifty percent probability from that curve. So we come here, take this curve. So here, this is my C of O, the critical flash of one. This is at the end of the curve here, which is the ninety nine uh, uh, point eight seven. I can find my the statistical flash flash over, which is the plus three of the standard standard deviation. This is the average value. This is the fifty percent. So we have one, two, three standard deviations. So here is my 99.87 flash over. Here is my withstand voltage, which is the 0.15 uh, withstand, withstand level. So here it is the 50% is 510. Now if we get, you get this one here, this would be like 510 from the curve. We don't have the five, the, the fifty percent here. Here we have it at different. We have five, thirty-two percent, eighty-three, ninety-five. We couldn't get the 90, 50 percent from, but from the curve we can get the 50. Okay, so this is 510 kilovolt. The SFO, the statistical uh, flash over is, which is this voltage level, is basically 552. The withstand voltage is, which is the 465. Now, we have also the uh, the dry and this is our the wet temperature. This is the 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 humidity. This is the pressure. Okay, then we, we have the CFO and corrected value. Okay, so we, we, we have to correct it to certain conditions, which is the standard conditions here. And then we find the CFO, the critical flash over voltage is equal to 536.6 uh, kilovolt. So here it is very time consuming. Imagine you have to do this is 400 times. Each time you apply the voltage, each time you see the flash over, you will call if there's a flash over or if there's no flash over. So it is really time consuming to come up with this with this value. It is an easy and fast uh, method that can be utilized uh, to do that, but we will uh, go for this uh, after after the break. So let me pause. Uh, hi everyone again. So let me uh, share the screen again now. Okay, so as I mentioned that the previous method I talked about it here, uh, the multi-level test method is time consuming. So we want to have another method that can give us good accuracy, but much less uh, actually uh, time consuming. So we have here the up and down method. And remember this name, up and down method. This is used in several uh, tests as well as we will see even in uh, in cables and in outdoor inserters as well, the up and down method. Okay, so how it works here. So we pick up an initial voltage level. Remember, this is for the 1.2 by uh, 50 micro. So this is for the lightning test. Okay, so we pick certain voltage. Okay, and then we apply the voltage. One shot, just one shot, not 100 times, just one shot. If it is, if the insulator will stand that voltage, we apply next shot. Okay. If uh, we stand up at delta T and apply a next shot and so on and so forth. If it break down, then apply the next shot with the, the minus delta T. The, after the first breakdown happens, you do the test 10 times and you count that. Okay, so let's see here. So this is uh, the up and down. This is an example. So we start at 940 kilovolt. So we, this is the first one. Okay. Now, there is no problem. 
uh, no flash over. So we increase the delta T. The delta T or the delta V is 30, uh, 30 kilovolt. So we tested, this is the second test at 970 kilovolt. Okay, it will stand also. So we go to the 1000 voltage kilovolt uh, test, number three. It will stand, we go to the 130. So this is number four, a flash over having. This is the first flash over. From the time of the first flash over, you have 10 readings. It doesn't matter those 10 readings, how many flash over, how many will stand there. We do that 10 times. So for example, here at 1030, there, there was a flash over having. So we reduce to 1000 uh, 1, kilovolt. This another flash over, reduce to 970. With the stand, increase to 1000. Uh, with the stand, Sorry, a flash over, reduce, and keep the, doing this 10 times. So the results are showing here. So this is your first shot. You have a flash over. You reduce the voltage at 1000, still a flash over. Then number three here, 970 is a with stand. So this is 970 is with stand. If it is with stand, you increase 30, a flash over. You reduce with stand. Uh, sorry, flash over. You reduced 940 with a stand, increase with a stand, 1000 with a stand, with a stand, and then at the last one, there will be a, a flash over. So these are the 10 tests that you uh, you have. So you have five of them with a stand, five of them of a uh, flash over. So you can count this. So the level at 940 is no flash over, and there is one with a stand at 970. We have three tests, one flash over and two with stand. At 1,000, two versus one. At 130, one flash over, one with stand. And finally, at 160, we have only one flash, one flash over. Now, how to calculate the CFO, the critical flash over, the statistical flash over, the with stand? Uh, I refer you to Kaufman book. Kaufman book is one of the famous books in high voltage engineering. There is a lot of math involved here to calculate the probability of failure. It's outside the scope of these slides or of this presentation. So if you are interested, you can go. If you want to know, I, I can scan the, if you don't have the book, Kaufman book, I can send it to you, uh, to you uh, the, the pages that uh, give you the formulas to calculate the CFO, the SFO, and the withstand voltage. Okay, so the previous tests are flash over tests. These are to, to see basically the cleavage distance, the dry arc distance against power frequency and against lightning. There is another category of tests. It's called the artificial contamination tests on outdoor installations. Okay, so there are two main type of tests based on the region. In Europe, they adapt one test for a flash over, but this is now they use artificial contamination. It's not just wet or dry. It is basically they use a contaminant, so they use water with certain conductivities uh, to do the to do the test. Now here, this is a look of uh, some post insulators. You see here the arcing on the surface. Now this is beside the scene, so there is a lot of uh, salt deposits here, and because of the humidity, this is uh, salt to start to dissolve, and then you will have an electrolyte on the surface. Then you start to have a leakage current happening on the surface of the insulators. Now, because the distribution of the current is not uniform, then you start to have a dry bands happening here. And those dry bands, they will be very high electrical stress. Then you start to have an arcing across those dry bands. We call it dry band arcing. Uh, we will summarize the, the procedure of the how this is happening in, in, in a few slides. Now, this is a very important uh, curve uh, about the effect of the contaminant on the flash over uh, of the three main types of uh, waveforms, the 1.2 by 50 microsecond, the switching, and the power frequency, okay? Now, what you see here, this is this curve, this is for clean curves, and this is for contaminations. Okay, so that these curves are this is for dry, this is for wet, and this is for contaminated. 
Now the wet is not contaminants, just water. Okay, we see the flash over. Of course, the flash over at wet, as I mentioned before, will be lower than at dry. So let's start from here. So we have here basically three curves. One for uh, this is for eye string. When you say eye string, it means that the insulators are in vertical position, like a little eye. There is V string as well, which is when you have two insulators like this, this configuration basically we use whenever there is wind for mechanical support of the of the insulation systems. So this is for an eye string. Okay. Now here is basically the like the uh, 1.2 by 50 microsecond. These three curves for dry, wet, and contaminated, they are not really different from each other. So the flash over of wet, of dry, of contaminated, when you apply 1.2 by 50 microsecond, there is no significant difference between, between them. Now, when you go for here for switching impulse, now you will start to see the difference between the two. So when you have, uh, as you can see here, the switching impulses here, the dry happens at much less, much higher voltage, the flash over than the width, which is higher voltage than the contaminant. You can see here three different distinct uh, values as we actually uh, uh, we we, uh, we increase the duration of the impulse. Okay, so whenever the impulse testing is lightning, there is very short period of time of the application. The impact of the surface condition is not really important. But once you start to go for a switching, then the, 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 this this is really very uh, very important. Now here it is the 60, 60 hertz here. Again, there is a clear difference the time of uh, flash overs in microseconds. Okay. So here it is basically uh, again you can see the clear much clearer uh, uh, difference. Okay. Now for very long time here. This is times very, very long time, meaning that you apply the voltage. This is the nominal voltage for the 230 kilovolt. Okay. So that this voltage level is tested for 230 kilovolt line to line. Okay. Now when the contamination level becomes very, very severe, then the breakdown or the flashover happens at the normal voltage as well. Okay. So that's something uh, very important and you don't want to avoid. But this is something inevitable for outdoor installation because they are subjected to the contamination, to the pollution. Uh, and these are, if not uh, washed properly or correctly at the right time, then you can have a flash over at the normal voltage here, as you can see here. But this is, will take some time. It depends on the severity of the, of the pollution that uh, we have here. Yeah. So as I said here for the 1.2 by 50 microsecond, there is no change in the flash over between the contamination, the wet and the dry. For switching, there is a clear change and the main drop is having for the 50, 60 uh, Hertz range. Now let's talk about the contamination problem. How, what things happens? Okay. So basically here you have the insulator, have some sort of visualization with the text so that you can understand. Now, insulators, because it's at the outdoor conditions, you start to collect some pollutant on the surface. And this is a very slow process, taking a long time. Now, it depends on the severity of the pollution, it could be some areas faster than others. Now, those pollutions, they have conductive particles, especially if you are, if your insulator is close to the sea, okay, because of the wind, uh, you will have some sort of salt deposit. If there is no humidity to dissolve this salt, there is no issue because a dry pollutant doesn't harm the insulator. What harm the insulators once you start to getting wet? And this wet is not because of the rain, because as we said, we mentioned the rain is, could be a reason, but the rain most of the time washes the insulator. So the rain is bad when you have a, a pollutant, but it's not as bad as other type of uh, 
wetting agents like for example dew dew is or high humidity that is more severe because when you have a dew what will happen basically you will have not washing out the contaminant but the contaminant will start to uh, dissolve and having an conducted electrolyte on the surface so once you start to have uh, water uh, wetting here so this will start to dissolve and then you will have an electrolyte, a wetting electrolyte on the surface. Now, once you start to have a wetting electrolyte, from one side we have high voltage, from the other side we have ground or vice versa. It depends if this is a post insulator or suspension insulator. Then you start to have a leakage current to flow on the surface. You start to have here current flowing on the on the surface of the insulator. Okay. Now those the current density of those insulator uh, those Currents, they are not uniform. So, you certain areas you will have more current than others. So, this will uh, do the following you start to have some part of the wetted water dry. So, this is your contaminant here, like this. Here, for example, you will see here this is dry because at this area here, the current density is much, much higher. Okay of the current, the current will produce heat. The heat will actually dry part of the area. Then you start to have what we call them as dry bands. Now, the dry bands, basically, there is an issue here because from one side, this is a conductive. So this is like ground. So the, here, the potential will be like almost zero voltage. And from the other side, this is basically coming from the high voltage. So this here you will have here very very high voltage. We have very high electrical stress over a very small band or gaps. Then you start to have an arcing on the surface, and this is what we call the dry band uh, arcing. And those dry band arcing, if we are talking about ceramic insulators, uh, they will basically uh, can uh, evolve to a complete flashover. Once you have a flashover. If you have a closer, you will have a closer action, which is a breaker that open and close, open and close. Now, most of the time, that when a flashover happens, it will wipe the insulation, it will clean the insulation many times. So that will not happen frequently. Sometimes it does not. The flashover keep on doing this, depending on the severity of the of the pollution. But most of the time, it happens only once. So the closer will open and close. When when it close. The fault has been cleared, so there is no there is no issue. But if the fault persists, then the closer after three four operations depends how what is the sitting, then you will have a permanent basically uh, opening of the of the circuit uh, the circuit breaker. Now, if you have a polymer insulator, this dry band arcing can cause aging and can cause damage to the uh, to the surface of the of the insulators. Uh, I will try again also, hopefully what time allows to allocate uh, one lecture about improving the outdoor insulation systems uh, using washing, using uh, coating, using rubber insulators, what are the difference between these insulators. Hopefully we will have one lecture to talk about that after the term paper. So there are two basically factors that decide the severity of the contaminant. The first one is how much soluble salt, conductive particles like NaCl is available, and also what, how many, or how much the amount of inert material like a clay. Now the clay or foam, it does not contribute to the conduction, it does not contribute to the development of the leakage current, but it uh, contributes indirectly by holding the NaCl, because the NaCl, it needs something to hold it to the surface, and that is the, the job of the insoluble matters or the inert material like, like clay. So we basically quantify the existing of both of them using two parameters. The first one we call it the equivalent salt deposit density or the ESDD. This is to quantify the NaCl. So there is a, in, the, in the ANSI standard and the IEC standard, there is a way how to uh, measure this and this is basically uh, we measured as milligram per centimeter squared milligram of how much salt we have per uh, per the uh, surface area of the insulator 
The other one we call it the non soluble uh, deposit resistant entity or the NSDD. And as I mentioned, both of them are basically quantified using uh, mg milligram of the either the soluble or the non soluble material by centimeter square of the surface of the, of the material. Now, as per the IEC standard 60587, uh, we classify the contamination of certain area based on the amount of the ESDD. So if it is from 0 to 0 0.03 milligram centimeter square, this is called clean or very light. As this increase, go to light, moderate, and, and heavy. Also, there is similar standard as well in the IEEE or the ANSI standard as well. Now, for the wetting mechanisms, uh, light, drizzle, and mist, fog and dew, most of the failure happen when you don't have very uh, clear wetting on the surface. I mean, very intense wetting. Rain only counts for 12% of the flash over. Most of the wetting that lead to a flash over is a mild type of wetting. So there is enough water to dissolve the pollutant, but not enough water to wash the insulator uh, completely. As I mentioned, this is why we need to do some cleaning some uh, regular cleaning for those uh, for the for the insulators which is basically uh, something that uh, can cost a lot of money as I, as i mentioned hopefully i will arrange a lecture to talk about improving the insulation system outdoor uh, systems uh, now uh, snow ice is also when it start to melt I, I was in a visit uh, recently uh, in January, actually, to a utility company in Calgary, and there uh, we have uh, inspection of substation where we want to evaluate its health conditions. So uh, I use an ultrasonic sensor to detect if there's any arcing, and we noticed that in the early morning there's a huge arcing on the, on the insulators. By the noon time, this arcing completely disappeared, and we realized that this is, was because of the snow melting. So when the snow start to melt, you start to have uh, electrolyte uh, water on the surface. You start to have arcing because of warming. The day start to get a bit warm because of the warming of the uh, uh, arcing. The whole snow uh, or ice dissolved, or the, the ice melted. When it melted. The drive and arcing completely, completely stopped. Now, what are the methods we use to test against a flash over due to a pollutant? There are two standard methods. The first one is called the salt fault most method, which is mainly in Europe. And the other one is called the uh, clean fog test. We use this method mainly in North America. So these are the two standard methods we use to test the insulator is basically against uh, contamination and to see their withstand voltages. Now, these methods are basically developed for glass and porcelain insulators. And now we uh, basically can use them. We use them actually now to see the aging of non-ceramic insulators, and especially on for the salt fog test. So we use the salt fog test as an aging mechanism, accelerated aging mechanism to see under arcing conditions, how the silicon rubber can withstand uh, this, uh, this arcing. But for, it is basically these two methods, they were mainly designed or uh, used for ceramic uh, insulators, both glass and porcelain. Now, the methods basically they use the 50% withstand voltage for a given degree of contamination, and we use the up and down method. So they increase the voltage if they withstand. Reduce the voltage, flash over, reduce the voltage, and so on and so forth. And the maximum withstand contamination at uh, a given voltage will be would be recorded. Uh, this is a salt fog chamber. This is we used to have something like this at the University of Waterloo here. So uh, basically, uh, we uh, we have the insulators here. I will start from here. This is the supply here. The cable we supply. This is the pushing. So we apply the supply. To the uh, conductor. Now we have the insulators here, and we try to distribute them around. Uh, this fuses to as a protection mechanism if there is flash over having so that it will be removed from the system. And uh, 
we uh, have a, bit of a large water container and we control the conductivity of the water container here and we spray the water. There is a water pump here. So we spray the water. The water will be collected and re-sprayed again. So it's like a closed loop here. And the conductivity, for example, in the standard flash over test is 16. Thousand micro siemens per centimeter. This is the conductivity we use as per the uh, IEC uh, stand. So, as I said, this method for flash over mainly used in Europe and Asia. Uh, the the voltage is applied until flash over happens. So, you hang the insulators, you control the conductivity, you apply until the flash over. After the flash over, the cell salt is reduced and the test is repeated. If level problem again, again, we, we keep on reducing the, the salt. If not, then the salt contamination will be increased in a similar way like the up and down method I mentioned before for the impulse testing of the, of the transformer. Of the insulators, I mean. Here is, uh, this is just a typical leakage column uh, of uh, insulators. This is 120 hours. So sometimes we do the test for 1,000 hours. And you see here there is this randomness. This is the raw data. And you see this is the moving average. This is the current in the units with those spikes. So this is test conducted basically of a salt fog test to uh, see the aging of uh, rubber material, the impact of those arcing on the surface of the of the current. So this is the time series. So this is we just collect the data every like one minute. We will do one measurement. And we save the data and see the trend of the of your uh, leakage current on the surface of the of the insulators. So, what are the advantages and disadvantages of the salt fog test? Okay, so this is a good method to test the full uh, insulator profile. There are some other tests used to test the material itself, like the inclined plane test. Uh, I have a short video in my channel if you are interested. If you go to the outdoor insulator corner. We'll see a couple of videos about testing of the outdoor insulations. This is a quick method. Now, the wetting here is happening, as I mentioned, you are applying a salt fog. So it is by droplet, uh, water droplet measurement on the surface. And that is the ONAT, the only wetting uh, mechanism happening in the field. Because as I said, resin mist is more common, more cause of the problem in outdoor insulator than uh, the uh, water engagement that we see here in that test. Uh, correlation of uh, between this test and the field is not easy. There's big differences between what is happening. Uh, also, because we, we spray a cor uh, salt fog here, uh, there is a corrosive nature. So you have to do a lot of maintenance to the chamber every, uh, after a uh, few weeks. You have to change everything because of the, the corrosion that happens. Uh, this is not suitable for DC because you need a supply that can supply large current for a long time. DC supplies, they have a problem in terms of the power amount that they can supply. They can't be usually supply long current for a long time. The second method is called the clean fog test. Now, this is the method that used in North America. So basically here, you bring the insulators and you pre-contaminate them by dipping them in a slurry. So this is something uh, study I was doing here. So this is the insulator, this is the slurry here. So basically, basically the slurry is a combination uh, of uh, a certain inert material and conductive material. Okay, and you combine, you make you make a slurry there, and then you insert or you immerse your insulator in them. And so use NaCl and kaolin. Uh, this is as your conductor, this is as your inert material, and you uh, dip it there for some time, then you take there, take the sample and you hang it uh, to allow it to dry, then you will have something like this. You have the insulators with surface, those holy uh, CD is basically hanging uh, to the surface of the insulator and drying with the surface of the, of the insulator. Then you hang the insulator inside, similar like the fog chamber of the salt fog, but here we generate a steam. Steam, steam. This is why I put clean fog test. So that steam is not conductive. The conductive is basically in the pollutant. So whatever conductivity you want to have, 
we put it with the kaolin. But the steam that we generate is clean from, it doesn't have any of this uh, contaminations. And then the test lasts for about one hour. Now the voltage is, we have the voltage is constant. If the, uh, the system would stand, we add either we, uh, or flash over, we either add more or less contaminations, same way like the up and down procedure mentioned mentioned before. Now, what are the advantages and disadvantages of this method? This is more representative of the field because this is what's happening in the field. You have deposit of the pollutant on the surface of the insulator, and then whenever there is some moisture, whenever there is some wetting, then you might have a flash over. Uh, it is much easier to relate to the ESTD than the, the salt fog test. Now, this is more complicated, more time consuming, because as I said here, you have to uh, put the insulators here, dip it here, leave it for some time. Uh, it's usually 24 to 14 hours to dry, do the test, repeat the test, uh, and each time to prepare the sample is time consuming. So it's much lengthier procedure. Uh, also, it is uh, when you do the dipping, you might not have a very good uniform distribution, basically, of the contaminant in the surface, which can sometimes affect the quality of the, of the results. Final thing I would go up is the underground cables. Underground cables is extremely important, as it's especially in distribution system. Uh, in some countries, they don't use overhead lines at all in distribution systems. Uh, in some countries, they use over, uh, overhead lines only on uh, areas with a very low uh, density of population. But once the population is, is high, then they use underground cables. So underground cables is extremely important assets, and their failure is uh, has an issue compared to outdoor. In outdoor insulator, if you have a failure, you can see the problem. You can identify the location. If a failure happened in underground cable, it is sometimes a nightmare to find the location. Sometimes the cables are old, even you don't have the map of those uh, cables. You have to dig in multiple, dig in multiple locations to find where is exactly the, fail, the failure habit. So this is why the nature of the test in underground cable is a bit different than the nature of test of transformers or outdoor as we will, I will see. So the underground cables, there are different, uh, different types of uh, basically test depending at what stage your uh, cable manufacturing is. I have here what the first one is the, at the development stage. Okay. Now in the development here, you are there are some special tests on models, raw materials, prototypes. Okay. So this is support. You go and do some material test. Uh, you want to do some uh, small sample tests. So that is at the development stage. Now. When you go as a utility to the cable manufacturer, there's something called pre-qualification tests that you have to do. And these pre-qualification tests are composed of different tests. We'll talk about it here. Uh, some of them, we, we use them in the, using independent uh, laboratories. And sometimes some of the tests, we do them also at the, uh, at the manufacturing facilities. So this is to get the approval. So the utility will say that, okay, we take from your cables, you have to do the pre-qualification tests. Then after that, you will go for the production in, for, uh, before you, sub, you, 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 you actually manufacture certain cables. Then you do here the sample tests and the routine tests as well. Okay, there's certain sample tests and, and here is what you are referring to about the sample uh, the sample tests and this has happened usually at the manufacturer laboratory you don't need to use an independent laboratory then there are tests you do at the installation this is the commissioning test before you energize the system there are certain tests then during the service there are some diagnostic tests lifetime analysis tests uh, so those ones are basically at the site or in the labs finally when there's a failure that happens, then you have to analyze the, the failure that happens. So today we'll talk about only these two types of test, the pre-qualification and the uh, uh, production. 
the Sigri group. Sigri group basically is a well-known group in Europe. This is what is equivalent to the IEEE we have here. The IEEE, we have the ACTIVE standard or the ANSI standard comes out of it. The SIGRI, the IEC standard comes from the SIGRI working uh, groups. So we came up here with the standard uh, that adapted by the IEC 62067. And this is for the pre-qualifications. So the material to be tested has to be 100 meter in length. And you will include all accessors like cable turbinations, cable joints for 100 meter. Uh, the test, uh, you have to uh, install it uh, in a very practical installation conditions, like using uh, duct tunnels, direct burying, and so on and so forth. You apply a voltage for at 1.7 of the rated voltage, and you do the test for 100 years. There is also a thermal cycles that you do for the test. Now, so the test, see here the test, the, this is done for 100 years, sorry, for one year, one full year. Okay. Uh, it seems I'm getting tired. Uh, 100 years, no one, <laughs> uh, no, this will never end. So it's just for one year, you, have, you do the test, but it's not just you are electrically stressing the, the cable, but also thermally you are stressing the cable. Because when you apply the voltage here, the voltage is you are stressing the insulation uh, by the electrical stress. Okay? But the voltage, the high voltage does not give you basically high temperature. And we know that the current, one of the issues with the cables is when you have a loading. Okay? So then you have to increase the temperature. So we do thermal cycles. Uh, we increase the temperature about uh, 90 degrees centigrade okay, for two to four hours. And you do that for 180 uh, cycles. So this, you have those cycles. Now you should not have any failure happening during the whole year. Okay. Now, after you finish the aging, you take three samples, each one is 10 meters, and they have to pass lightning impulse test. So for example, for 400 kilovolt cable, you, have, you test it at 1425 kilovolt. Okay, so that's something uh, very important. Also, you examine the cable samples, and there should be no signs of deteriorations uh, that might affect the cable uh, in, in, in real uh, new system. That is the pre qualification test. I was one time visiting Kima, and at that time, there was a test going on here. So, you see here the cables basically is going through burials, through tunnels, through different things. This is to simulate the real life conditions. There is a bending happening in the cable. So this is how we'll have some or impose a certain mechanical uh, stress on the, on the cable. So that is the pre-qualification test. Before you supply to the customer, you have to do that. Then this is the type test for high voltage cable about 30 kilovolt. Again, these are type tests for the pre-qualifications also. So you have the impulse test and you have the EC uh, test and here is you apply 10 impulses and uh, positive 10 impulses negative at a degree okay? and also the voltage for minutes has with the set. This is a high bot test. The impulse test how we do it in the cables. So we do it under both lightning and switching impulses. Okay. And Basically, here you uh, the impulse generator is a big capacitor, and the cable is another capacitor. So you are charging from one capacitor, which is the uh, Marx generator, to another capacitor, which is basically the uh, the cable. Uh, and hence, here the cable capacitance has to be much less than the generator capacitance. Otherwise, there will be a problem in the efficiency. You will not be able to deliver the voltage. To the to the cable. This is why we do the test for kilometers of the cable because the cable uh, capacitance usually it is like picofarad per meter. So we need to select a short cable so that you don't have a very high capacitance that would impact your uh, your uh, cable uh, or your generator efficiency. These are some uh, routine tests for medium and this is for high voltage cables. So for example here. Uh, you apply AC with a stand voltage tests uh, for 15 minutes. You apply the voltages here and depends 
on the voltage uh, rating of this is the uh, the phase and this is the line to line uh, voltages so if it is uh, let's say 15 kilovolt line to line system voltage level you apply it for 40 kilovolt you stay for 15 minutes and similar to the transformer there should be no no failure uh, at all the partial discharge test we'll talk about that later on i will talk about partial discharge uh, this is for high voltage cables as well. So the the uh, bridge stress of cable at 1.75 kV. And so this is for partial discharge. Again, the partial discharge talk about it later on. But here the AC test we apply 2.5 times the rated uh, voltage single line to ground for 30 uh, 30 minutes, and there should be no breakdown at all coming to the to the cables. So that is an overview of the test in transformers, outdoor installations, and cables. And we see here uh, how we can utilize those generators that we talked about in these tests, the importance of those tests, because as we know that the transformers or all these assets will be subjected to those stresses, different type of stress. So we want to make sure that before the product or the assets leave the premises of the factory, we have actually tested them and make sure that we can withstand those tests.